Hello and welcome to GameSack. I wanted to make a video about the RetroTINK 4K for Mike Chi that I've been testing for a while, mainly because other people's videos on it have been doing pretty well and I want some of that. Anyway, the RetroTINK 4K is basically a video scaler that can scale almost anything up to a 4K resolution, you know, for your 4K TV. It does not come cheap, however, as I think Mike said he wanted to get the price down below $100,000. Or was that $1,000? Eh, same thing. Regardless of if you want to get one or not, you're probably at least interested in seeing what it can do. So let's check it out. This is my prototype RetroTINK 4K. For $100,000, I think the case could be a bit less flimsy. Actually, this is a 3D printed temporary case as the real thing will be injection molded and maybe even have a spoiler and a racing stripe. But what's important here are all the inputs that this thing offers. You have your S video, composite video, and stereo inputs on the front. You also have two buttons that don't look like they're gonna be on the final unit, so treat them like the customers at your retail job and ignore them. They don't really do anything anyway. Over here is the SD card slot, and each unit comes with a pre-imaged SD card which holds stuff like your firmware, profiles, and other nonsense. On the right side, you have your SCART input. It doesn't work with JP21, which is the same shape and size. But come on, who uses JP21 anymore? This can accept all SCART formats except VGA. Around back, you have a bunch more inputs. On the left, you have a full set of component video inputs with audio but it can also be configured for RGB with sync on green, or you can plug a composite video cable into the green jack. Next are a couple of RCA jacks for audio to use with the VGA connector, but this will be a mini jack instead on the final production unit. And this can handle much more than just VGA. You can route component, all flavors of RGB, S video, and even composite video. Then there's a Toslink optical input, or SPDIF if you prefer. This can handle any type of audio that this usually does, such as LPCM and compressed surround like DTS or Dolby Digital, and it sends it out over the HDMI untouched. Then you have your HDMI out and HDMI in. The HDMI input accepts up to 1080p at 60 frames per second. The HDMI input will accept the same audio formats that the optical input will, including compressed surround like old school Dolby Digital and DTS. This is perfect for things like the Xbox 360. However, the PlayStation 3 won't see that the RetroTINK can accept this if you set the HDMI audio up automatically. So you'll need to force Dolby Digital or DTS on and then it'll work. 5.1 or 7.1 linear PCM won't pass through, nor will Dolby True HD, DTS Master Audio, Dolby Atmos, or DTS-X. That's right, go to hell, Wii U and Switch owners. Not like those systems have a ton of content that offers surround anyway. But if you want to have your cake and eat it too, you can use an HDMI audio extractor or splitter like this. Send one of the outputs to the RetroTINK input, which itself goes directly into your TV, and the other output to one of the inputs on your AVR for the full surround sound experience. The unit also comes with a remote, which will look more professional than this because, again, this is the prototype. The handwriting on the official unit will be much better. Okay, now that we've taken a look at the unit itself, let's check out what it actually does. When you power the unit on, you'll get a black screen on the default input, unless you have something connected in power to that input. By pressing this button on the remote, it calls up the main menu. The first item is input selection, and here you select the input that you want. Press the enter button to select it, and then press the back button to go back. The next item on the menu is the HDMI output, and here you can select your output resolution, which defaults to 4K60. I mean, you're probably not gonna get this if you don't have a 4K display. There are also other things here that you can mess with, which maybe I'll come back to later if I don't forget. The next item down is profiles, which allow you to save and load your custom profiles. And the RetroTINK 4K will come preloaded with a bunch of profiles done by Firebrand X. You can create a ton of profiles. Not just a profile for each console you own, but multiple profiles for every game you have, if you want. Down in advanced settings, you have a bunch of stuff to adjust the image to your liking. 
for scaling, I personally prefer integer scaling, so for example, I like having a 9x vertical scale for the 16-bit games. You can also do 10x, which slightly crops the top and bottom, but come on, that's no good for recording gameplay footage for GameSack. I need the entire image for the show. But just for playing casually, that might be fine for you. The Processing slash Effects tab allows you to mimic the look of a CRT in many different ways, and a lot of that can be quite convincing. There's a lot of parameters that you can adjust, and you can even make your own masks. It really does go a long way to making these games look and feel more like they did 100 years ago. If you inject HDR on the HDMI output menu, it really helps with the dimming that the fake scan lines cause, and it makes it much more enjoyable. You can even adjust the amount of nits if it's too dark or too bright, but I'm not entirely sure how accurate this is. It doesn't really matter though, just make it brighter or darker until it looks good. As of the current build, the HDR looks great on my LG C1 OLED TV, but not very good at all on my BenQ 4K monitor. I also can't engage Deep Color, which is 10-bit video on the BenQ or my older LG C8. So it's really gonna depend on your TV. I can't promise that HDR is gonna look great. Hopefully this can be worked out, and I think it will be. When it is all working though, it's pretty awesome, and it definitely makes these old blocky games look more palatable. Personally though, I have no issues with razor sharp pixels either, and the RetroTINK 4K doesn't half-ass it either way. The deinterlacer setting allows you to choose how it handles interlaced modes, and that includes 1080i. The HDMI receiver tab is for when you're using the HDMI input as your source. For example, say you're playing Shredder's Revenge on the Nintendo Switch here. You go to engage scan lines on the RetroTINK 4K, but you can barely see them because the RetroTINK is trying to apply scan lines to a 1080p source. I mean, it has no clue that the game uses pixel art. So on the receiver, you can set the decimation factor to 4, which slices up the screen, meaning one pixel now takes up 4 horizontally. Set the decimation phase to 3 of 4. Then, go back to the scaling section and turn the vertical prescale to 1 slash 4. This does the same thing vertically. Now you can mess around in the image processing area and get perfectly matching scan lines and CRT masks. True, the game does include a couple of CRT filters of its own, but now you have way more control and you can do this for any game. Don't forget to save this as a new profile. Then, name it on your computer and put it into the appropriate folder. How you organize all this is up to you. Again, you can do this for any and every game if you want, and you might have to. For example, on Blaster Master Zero, you need to set your switch for 720p output. That's the only way to get proper fitting scan lines on this particular game. When you get it right, it looks fantastic. Messing with these settings is a lot of fun, but it's not everyone's cup of tea. But I imagine if you want to pick one of these up, you're going to want to take advantage of all the bells and whistles. You can plug it in and just use it, but come on, you don't buy a Ferrari only to drive it to the grocery store twice a week. Next down is the RGB and component ADC. And here is where you get into the nitty gritty of dialing that pixel perfect phasing of your image. You might be tempted to just go down to auto calibrate and click phase, but that won't do you much good unless you dial in the decimation factor and sample rate first. This can sometimes take quite a while to find the perfect spot where you should be. After you have that dialed in, then you can do auto phase, which only chooses the best estimation phase for you, not the sample rate or factor. It does an okay job, but honestly, I feel it's better to eyeball your own phase. I do, however, recommend auto gain to make sure that the full brightness range of your console is being represented. Next down is the SDP decoder, which is only for composite and S video sources. Then there's audio input. This allows you to assign any audio source to any video input which was sorely missing on the RetroTINK 5X. You can also have dual mono from your left or your right channels, swap left and right if you need to, or change the sample rate and adjust the gain as some systems are too loud or too quiet. Gotta tell you, setting the Genesis to 96 kilohertz makes it sound a lot cleaner. That's because the console itself is above 48 kilohertz. Most of this stuff in here only affects analog audio sources. Below that, in the OSD slash system menu, you can decide where the GUI lives if you need to move out of the way for a little bit, update the firmware, and things like that. So, what else can it do? Lots! 
Now, there's no way I'm gonna remember to cover every single feature. And also, I'm quite lazy, so there's that to take into account, but I can show you gameplay from various consoles and talk about my general experiences with it. So, let's do it. Turbo is all yours. First up, let's check out some GameCube footage. I'm basically just showing consoles randomly in this part. Well, more or less. Here, I'm using the official Nintendo component cables and the console is running in 480p. It scales up to 4K and it looks great. YouTube compression notwithstanding, of course. I also have a profile for widescreen games and again, it's amazing. I'm using profiles that I created myself along with a few from Firebrand X for games that appear in this section. How about Resident Evil 4, which is letterboxed? Well, now you can zoom it into exactly full screen. It looks a little rough because you have less vertical resolution than a proper anamorphic widescreen presentation, but otherwise it's perfectly playable. Again, this is in 480p output at 4K. Since we're on the GameCube, let's look at the Game Boy Player running some Castlevania. It looks okay, but it certainly doesn't fill the screen. Thankfully, you can zoom it to your exact screen size with the scaling controls. It still looks pretty muddy, but at least you can play it full screen. Now, here's the Game Boy Player using Swiss running the GBI app, which is much cleaner. It can output in 360p, and here the RetroTank 4K is providing an 11x scale. That looks awesome, don't you think? You can do this with the component cables, or you can even use a digital solution like the Carby. Of course, you can even engage a couple of different LCD filters if you have an aversion to straight up pixels. Or you can even just use regular scan lines if you prefer. But hey, might as well go for the LCD look and feel like you're playing on a giant 77-inch Game Boy Advance or however big your TV is. Let's swing over to the 16-bit consoles for a sec. This is a Genesis game that uses a 320-pixel wide resolution running at a 9x scale. It almost goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, it looks awesome. And even games that use a wimpy 256-pixel wide resolution look sharp as a tack as well. Nice! You can increase the horizontal softness if you really must get rid of the dithering for some reason. I could never play like this, but if you add some scan lines and other effects, it might help it to appear like it's a tad sharper. Of course, we can't forget about the few games that have an interlaced mode, and as you can see, the RetroTINK 4K handles them as it should. The interlacing can really only be so good though. Going over to the Super Nintendo, games that run at 256 pixels wide, which is most of them, look as sharp as attack at a 9x scale. Firebrand X even created an 11x scale profile for the letterboxed games like Street Fighter 2 and many of the other games that are letterboxed, so now it's almost full screen. He also did a profile for the few games that run at an incredible resolution of 512 pixels wide, like Kirby's Dream Land 3 here, which mixes low and high resolution assets. You can see that the foreground trees use the high resolution mode, whereas everything else is a low res 256 pixels. When the game transitions to a 256 pixel only screen, it still looks perfect. Naturally, there's even a Firebrand X profile for Super Nintendo games that run in interlaced mode. The PC Engine slash TurboGrafx-16 looks good, but as of right now, I can't use it with HD RetroVision component cables, only SCART or composite. If I try with component, it usually doesn't even see that anything is connected. I don't know why only the component input is affected. I really hope that this gets fixed ASAP. The NES looks phenomenal at 9x scale, which gets everything on the screen. Love me some Castlevania 3. It might even look better at 10x, as often NES games will have glitches outside of this area anyway. Firebrand X even made a left crop version of both profiles when you play a game that gets kind of chunky on its left side. The Master System looks pretty good at 11x scale since every game without exception is letterboxed. Some games will show a colored border on the left that you may wonder why is that not cropped out. Well, because when you go to a non-scrolling screen, sometimes this area can fill in with graphics. Okay, let's get a little bit more crazy here. This is the PSP with its own component video output. I have never seen the PSP look so good. Now, it's not 100% perfect, but I'm not sure it could get any better on the real hardware. My profile here scales at exactly 8x in both dimensions. Of course, you can also toss an LCD filter on here and play it that way if you'd like it to look more like the actual PSP screen. You might be wondering how 3D PSP games look scaled up like this. Well, here you go. It's not bad at all. And here's a Vita game running on the PlayStation TV. Of course, you're gonna need a way to bypass the HDCP to feed it into the RetroTank. It doesn't look bad at all. 
But if your PSTV is hacked and has sharp scale installed, the scaling is even cleaner at 4X. Most people probably aren't going to notice the difference, but it's nice for those who are anal about such things, like myself. Now, let's check out the PlayStation 2. I want to show this console because the large majority of the games run in interlaced mode only. Like I said earlier, deinterlacing can only be so good. You'll often run into artifacts like this when something's flashing on screen. Blech. If you change the deinterlacing method to Bob, then that doesn't happen, but there's a lot of monitors and TVs out there that don't like Bob deinterlacing. They get some weird image retention thing going on. I think only IPS screens are like that, though. The PlayStation 2 looks phenomenal when it's in 480p, though. Some games can be forced into 480p with GSM. Sadly, not very many of them display properly this way. I wish the PlayStation 2 community was more active because I think they could develop this and make it super awesome. I'd love it if all games could be forced into 480p. If you run a game in 1080i like Gran Turismo 4 here, you will have all flavors of deinterlacing available to you, including motion adaptive. I feel it does a really good job here as any artifacts are super tiny at this high resolution. One interesting thing that Mike's working on is 2-2 pull down. Basically, this is a means of taking a game that doesn't have a 480p mode, runs at 30 frames per second, and displays them as a progressive image instead of using motion adaptive deinterlacing. Look at how the text jumps when I use motion adaptive deinterlacing. But when I use the 2-2 pull down, it's perfectly steady. If you have a game that's rock solid 30 frames per second and only has an interlaced mode, then this is for you. I found that it worked great on Midnight Club 3 and also Metal Gear Solid 3, both on the PlayStation 2 here. Final Fantasy X would work sometimes and then it would show combing and then it would be fine again. Mike says that this feature still needs a lot of work, but I figured that I'd show you. Another thing I want to mention is arcade games. These look incredible on the Retro Team 4K. Granted, the parts on a lot of these boards have aged, so the output isn't the sharpest thing ever, but it's pretty damn close. I've never seen such a good looking image come from the real hardware. I really don't think it can get much better, and honestly, it kind of rejuvenates them, for a lack of better description. They each need their own profile, though, as each board is basically its own system. And if you want, you can slap some filters on them and pretend you're at the arcade playing on a giant screen or something. And I know some of you are wondering what game this is. Well, I'm not going to tell you because I'm mean. Just kidding. It's Gun Force 2 from Irem, and it's awesome. I also tried some mini consoles like the Genesis Mini 2 here, and it works. I also tried the TurboGrafx-16 Mini, the Sega Astro City Mini, and the Taito Egret 2 Mini. It looks a little sharper this way rather than scaled up by the TV itself. If you use the same technique to get scan lines that I mentioned back when talking about the Switch, well, you can do that here as well. I don't have any of the Nintendo Classic slash Mini consoles to test, but if you use one, you'll want to use the Pixel Perfect mode and just stretch it a little horizontally with the RetroTank. That'll give you something closer to the proper aspect ratio as it's too skinny when playing on the Classic. Lastly, the analog line of consoles like the Super NT here work great, though they can be a little annoying to set up. They don't have a 240p over HDMI output, sadly, so you'll want to set the analog console to 720p output if you want to see the entire image. Then, in the width and height options on the analog system, set everything so it's exactly 3x. Then on the retro tank, you'll need to resize it to however it is that you want it. Oh, and don't forget to check Disable H and V Interpolation on the analog console, otherwise it's going to look like complete ass. I always thought these checkboxes were backwards, you should uncheck them if you don't want it. Now you can add scan lines and effects which are much better than what's built into the analog console. It takes a bit of work as well as an understanding of how it all does work, but once you get it set up, then it looks pretty damned awesome if I do say so myself. I'm betting that Firebrand X will eventually have some profiles for these systems along with some great instructions. No, we are not done yet. Still got more stuff I want to show you. The RetroTink 4K also has some other interesting things that it can do, like black frame insertion and 120 frames per second output. What the hell is this and why might you want it? So basically, black frame insertion inserts a completely black frame every other frame when the output is set to 120 frames per second. Why? 
Well, because it helps mimic the motion of a CRT and it results in scrolling and motion that looks much cleaner in real life than straight up 60 frames per second on a modern display. However, as you've probably already guessed, this does introduce some flicker into the image and naturally it dims it a little as well. Engaging HDR can help mitigate that. But seriously, it does make the edges of fast moving things seem cleaner when this is engaged, and most people can get used to the flicker, which honestly is super fast. Unfortunately, you can only do this at a maximum of 1440p because the RetroTINK doesn't have an HDMI 2.1 output to allow it to do it at 4K. Personally, I just game in 4K instead. The Tink also does a pretty good job of upscaling a lot of my old home movie videotapes. The upscaling is very clean, all things considered, and this basically looks as good as it possibly can. It's not perfect though, as it can't really do anything about time-based errors, which basically happens anytime there's an in-camera cut, which is just stopping and starting the recording. And back when I made these videos, let's just say there were tons of in-camera cuts. It makes my old chalkboard animations almost impossible to watch as it gets extremely jumpy and somehow randomly inserts frames from several seconds ago. It's very bizarre. This was all with my ancient Canon 8mm camera though. The footage of the newer chalkboard animations once I got a Sony Hi8 are much more steady and rarely jump. I'm guessing the Sony just made better recording so there were fewer time-based errors at its cuts. It's still not perfect though as sometimes a random cut will have a really big jump. By the way, there are no jumps when you watch these on a CRT. Such is the nature of analog video, I guess. So while it does a great job with the video quality and certainly the parameters afforded to you by all of the scaling, HDR, and image processing options, you shouldn't mistake this for a time-based corrector because it definitely is not. However, for movie lovers, the RetroTINK 4K has something very special in the deinterlace slash film settings. It features an inverse telecine mode, I'm pretty sure it's pronounced telecine as it seems to combine television and cinema, which is kind of what the word basically means. Oh well, who cares? Anyway, on movies converted for home use, a 3-2 pull-down method needs to be used, and as a result you can get some interlaced fields when watching old VHS and Laserdisc movies on a modern display. Engage the inverse teles sign here, and it takes anywhere between 15 and 30 seconds to detect the cadence of the video and lock on. The interlaced fields are reordered where needed, and now you have true progressive video. The RetroTINK 5X is also getting this feature. This kicks ass and all, but the RetroTINK 4K can output a true 24 frames per second. It is awesome being able to enjoy these ancient formats like VHS and Laserdisc here at the proper frame rate as most modern displays can do this natively. Now, not everyone can appreciate this, but I certainly can, and you should not feel bad if you can. It's just something that's super cool for video and movie nerds like myself. It also works great with letterboxed movies as now you can scale them to fit the screen perfectly. Yeah, it's not as good as a 4K Blu-ray, but I don't think this movie is even available on a wimpy 1080p Blu-ray. Come on, James Cameron, what's the holdup? Gonna need aliens as well while you're at it. And some movies, this is even more important as there's no true 24 frame per second progressive version of this one, not of the original one that matters anyway. You could even output this at 96 frames per second and engage black frame insertion to replicate the same flicker as the film projector. As a movie dweeb, I really like this feature and it breathes new life into the old VHS and Laserdisc collection. R2-D2, where are you? So, what do I wish the RetroTINK 4K could do better? Well, obviously, I'd like to be able to use my TurboGrafx-16 or SuperGrafx via HD RetroVision cables because that's how it's currently hooked up to my system but I'm fairly certain that Mike will be able to figure this out and have it fixed hopefully before the RetroTINK is released. I also wish it could pass linear PCM surround sound and other formats like Dolby Atmos through the HDMI input, however, I don't believe this is possible with the hardware. I'm also hoping for a way to enable a surround flag on the HDMI output. This would enable some modern AVRs like those from Denon and Marantz to process the stereo audio as Dolby Pro Logic. Otherwise, the audio is left and right speakers only. A ton of games like Rogue Leader here would greatly benefit from this. I'd like to be able to name my profiles when I save them so I don't have to remember what New Profile 1 and New Profile 2 is by the time I take my SD card to the computer to rename them. And of course, this is selfish, but I wish it could handle time-based errors in video better instead of jumping at some cuts. I'm not sure if this can even be improved, and honestly, it's not something that most people are going to care about.
I'd also like to see an adjustment for image curvature added to the image processing, which would give an effect like this, closer to a CRT, but that's another thing where I have absolutely no idea if it's even possible. There is, however, a tape mode that's currently in the works, but it's not quite ready to show off yet. I am definitely glad and excited that it'll be in there. All in all, not a ton of complaints, and I'm pretty sure my biggest one, which is about the turbo graphics, will be remedied fairly soon. And there you go, the RetroTINK 4K before it's even released. Now, Mike says he wants to get it out this year, and I really hope he's able to. As with anything I review in this nature, it's gonna get better in the future as the firmware evolves, but it's damned awesome right now. In fact, it's already become the daily driver for capturing footage for the show. So are you gonna pick one of these bad boys up, or does it piss you off merely because it exists? Let me know, in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. If you're like me, and I'm willing to bet that you are, you love blowing your nose, especially with Puff's brand Kleenex. There's just one problem. All the splinters! All tissues are a paper product, and all paper products come from wood, and wood can give you splinters. So, Puff's brand Kleenex now has less splinters. That's <laughs> 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 somewhat better. Puff's brand Kleenex, now with less splinters.